So Alzheimer's disease is essentially defined by two proteins, one amyloid that makes up the plaques, the plaque and tangle disease, and the protein tau that makes up the tangles. So those two proteins, in fact, define the disease. A major line of thinking in the theory of how Alzheimer's disease evolves is that amyloid is, in fact, the initiating process. So it comes from this precursor protein called APP, amyloid precursor protein, and that protein then gets cleaved by enzymes later on, usually an enzyme called alpha secretase cleaves the protein and the harmless residues are eliminated. Occasionally, in some people, instead of alpha secretase doing its work, the secretases beta secretase and gamma secretase intervene and cleave the protein to leave a residue of maybe 38, 40, 42 amino acids. And this is a particularly nasty residue that accumulates in the brain, is quite sticky, and goes down a pathway then to ultimately produce the amyloid neuritic plaque at the end of the day. So the amyloid cascade hypothesis sort of takes that whole sequence of events into account and suggests that if we intervene at various points in that cascade, we will be able to stop this abnormal processing of amyloid. Of course, this is all still theoretical, but there's a good deal of both animal, genetic, and human data that would support that. We're coming to an appreciation that's a bit different about the pathobiology and the trajectory of the pathobiology of um, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, the neurogenerative conditions. One of the appreciations really is that even though Alzheimer's is defined, again, by amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, that's a manifestation of disease that in the new framework that has been recently released and conceptualized by the NIA um, and the Alzheimer's Association, one can think about amyloid one's, one's amyloid pathology stage in the brain. And amyloid is a protein that we don't understand quite yet what its function is. It has something to do with maybe synapses in the brain and even potentially with learning or um, signal transduction. Um, but this amyloid protein, the, the 42 version of it, and the ratio of 42 to 40 is toxic. And it comes in dif different forms. So when it's finally processed, by these enzymes, base, and we'll talk about base and, and things like it, you get basically monomers. And then they develop, they stick together, they become um, maybe dimers and then multiple oligomers. Then they kind of sit there in protofibrils and then they develop fibers, so fibrils, and ultimately in a plaque. And that evolution may take quite a while. And it turns out that really some of the earlier forms may be toxic to synapses. So, so that's one appreciation that there, there's a very big lag time between people showing symptoms and actually having different stages of, of, of amyloidosis in their brain. Somewhere along the pathway, um, amyloid induces uh, neurofibrillary tangles. So this tau protein, which is inside the cytoskeleton, very important in axonal transport in the neurons, becomes hyperphosphorylated and dysfunctional. The way I describe it in, in, in some ways is that amyloid seems to be toxic kindling. So it's sitting around the brain, being toxic to synapses, kind of making them dysfunctional. Um, but really when you have probably the fire is when the, the, the match is lit and it's really the tangles that spread. And tangles we've known for a very, very long time correlate with much more neuronal damage and also they spread in a, in a, in a relatively well-known pattern. And they also go along with where people are having symptoms in those, in, in those centers. So there's the amyloid kind of score in some ways pathway. There's tau. And then, of course, then the effect of amyloid and tau on nerves, so neurodegeneration. So that we can potentially measure in different ways on MRI. We can look at atrophy, for example. But we're now getting these biomarkers um, that we're still developing. Um, to see synaptic damage with neuronegrenin or um, axonal damage with neurofilament light. And also there's the vascular component. So the brain's not sitting outside the body, it's sitting inside the body. 
and vascular damage accrues, and therefore, and also inflammation accrues. And inflammation can accrue in multiple ways in these pathways, or by the effect of toxins or pathogens, for example. It's a very, very complex story that makes things very heterogeneous. So both, we, you know, our environments are heterogeneous and our genetics are heterogeneous. So individuals have a combination of resilience factors or reserve and also vulnerabilities. And what, what we're appreciating is for an individual with late onset dementia syndromes, cognitive impairment or dementia, chances are if you say Alzheimer's pathology being present, you're right. You're probably 80, 90 percent right in, in, in the right setting. But that may not be the only component. So there's amyloid pathways, there's non-amyloid degenerative pathways with other proteins, TDP43, for example, tau, um, Lewy bodies, and then there's age-related pathways. So in an older individual, really neuropathology studies are showing, once you get into your, certainly in your 80s and definitely into your 90s, you tend to have um, more than one pathology. Um, as opposed to early onset syndromes where um, the diseases tend to be more pure in, in individuals in, their, say, in their 40s or 50s. Just actually very recently in the last um, uh, few weeks, there's been a, uh, a consensus group with a very, very important paper that came out in the journal Brain about um, the criteria for what they call late. It's a limbic, predominant, age-related TDP43 TDP proteinopathy. Uh, that is thought to really be present in 15 to 20 percent of individuals in their um, sort of 85 and above, let's say, that present with a typical Alzheimer's-like amnestic syndrome, and yet they actually don't have Alzheimer's pathology. So we're appreciating that not all syndromes, even though they may be very amnestic-like and, uh, and Alzheimer's-like, especially in older individuals, are caused just by Alzheimer's disease that the story is much more complex, that we have to really be able to parse out the underlying pathobiology and then come up with specific diagnosis pathways to come up with the cause and contributing factors. And we're trying to do that with, with biomarkers and um, also with guidelines as far as how to evaluate individuals with symptoms.